Hi everyone. So today I wanted to talk about jumping into the deep side of the pool in astrophotography. Uh, galaxy season is coming up here pretty soon and you know when that comes in you start to lose a lot of the the wide field targets that we're used to uh, during the rest of the year. And so this year I wanted to kind of move into something that would let me look deeper at those kind of close-in targets. Um, like many people in this hobby, I started off doing visual astronomy and I started by getting, you know, a very big uh, SCT scope that uh, was great for looking at the moon and planets, but really wasn't uh, a good fit for me for getting started with astrophotography. A lot of people recommend starting with a small refractor uh, and working up from there because a small refractor is looking at a much larger part of the sky um, so it makes things like your your mount quality and guiding more forgiving uh, because you don't notice the the motion as much in your final images but also a refractor tends to be you know very much kind of set and forget in in terms of maintenance of the scope right uh, those lenses that are in there if they go out of alignment you've got a broken scope right it isn't something that you're typically going to be fixing yourself so Looking at a reflector, you tend to have more maintenance as well. So, you know, that's why I went with the refractor for a long time. But, uh, you know, as those get up larger and larger in size and in focal length, they get, uh, one, a lot more expensive, and two, a lot heavier, um, and just honestly not the, the best, most cost-effective way to get the kind of quality that you want. So... Going back into this, I decided to go ahead and, and jump back in with uh, an SCT again. This is the Celestron Edge HD 800. It's an eight inch uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope, which means that it is a reflector uh, with a couple of different properties on it. So it's got, uh, it's got a little bit of a lens, this glass corrector plate, uh, they call it at the front here, and then a large primary mirror in the back uh, that then bounces light up to this secondary mirror here, which then bounces the light back to the end of the tube where you hook in, you know, your, um, your camera or your eyepiece, that kind of thing. Um, the real benefit of an Edge HD versus a standard, uh, you know, 8-inch Celestron uh, or SCT is really that it's got an extra optic at the very back that, uh, you know, a lens that will flatten this thing for you. So that combined with, you know, some of the other things they put in here um, to just make a better imaging piece of equipment, make this, you know, kind of a, a nice go-to for longer focal length astrophotography. With my refractor, I've got kind of a, a, a default focal length of about 500 millimeters and get it up to about 800 with an extender for it. But this guy runs at a focal length of 2000 millimeters so much much more zoomed in than what i had before you know and that's that's exactly what i'm looking for however it comes with a host of kind of challenges that you need to deal with the first one is going to be your mount so while this is honestly about the same weight if not a little bit lighter than my refractor because uh, Takahashi refractor is kind of built like a tank so it's, it's pretty heavy for the size um, you know there there's actually a little bit more that goes on for having a mount with one of these versus one of those the first one is is that when you're zoomed in more any errors in your mount become more noticeable so you have to to make sure that your mount is is really going to be pretty solid um but the other part of it is is just if you look at the the how wide this is is any kind of wind will affect these more than it will your other kind of smaller scopes so i originally actually bought the the nine and a quarter inch diameter one of these and tried to, to give it a try and i just could not get anything that was really stable you know I, I could get some pictures but every one of my stars looked like a football um, and the big reason for that was is that i had about eight or nine mile an hour winds uh, kind of gusting around and every little gust would shake this thing just a little bit you know and my mount just my mount would bring it back but it just couldn't hold it stable so i ended up returning that one and going with the eight inch instead to see if that would be better and we'll take a look at the results of that here in a minute 
Um, but so wind does play a factor in this. You need to make sure that you've got a mount that can handle more than uh, than what you think. You know, the, the usual rule of thumb a lot of times is to say, you know, half or, or no more than two thirds of what the stated weight capacity is for your mount uh, for, for astrophotography. But when you're dealing with something that's like an SCT, you may need to go even a little further with that. You know, the overall, the weight uh, that I'm running is, is less than half of what the, the stated uh, weight limit for my, my CEM60 is. So how do I guide this thing? So with a normal refractor telescope, a lot of times uh, the way that we all start off is we have a small guide scope, which is essentially a finder scope that you can put a camera on the back of that's piggybacking on top of this, right? And it's going to watch a star while this is imaging and it'll, it'll keep everything in line. Um, and in general, that works really well, especially for shorter focal length. Um, but when you get to longer focal length, a lot of times that kind of setup doesn't work as well. And there's a few reasons for that. The first one is that when you are looking at uh, a small guide scope, when you're on a refractor, a lot of times the, the pixel resolution, the scale that you're looking at in those two cameras is going to be pretty close. You're going to have your, um, you know, because maybe you've got a 50 millimeter or 60 millimeter guide scope and then a 100 millimeter uh, main scope. And those two things are, are pretty close to each other overall. And the focal length may only be off by 100 or 200. Um, but when you move to this, putting that same kind of scope on top here, I'm going from that 60 millimeter guide scope might have a focal length of 300. This one has a focal length of 2000. And that, that order of magnitude kind of difference just makes it very difficult for, even though the guide scope may think that it's holding pretty well, it may not be good enough for how zoomed in you are. The other part of it is something called flexure. Um, and that's really where you'll have this, you know, the guide scope and the main scope moving at slightly different rates. That doesn't typically happen with your refractors as much, um, you know, especially if you have a good set of rings on. But with a reflector, especially an SCT, it can become a real problem because that primary mirror in the back, the mirror is actually movable, right? That's how you focus with it by default. Um, and so when you're moving, when the scope's moving throughout the night, right, uh, and especially when it's passing near the meridian, gravity might slightly move that mirror. Doesn't mean things are getting out of focus per se, but it may just may just tilt the angle, which changes where things are showing up just a little bit. And if you're guiding with a top scope, it's not going to see that same movement, and therefore your images may start to streak one way or another. So those problems together are one of the things that, that made it very difficult for me when I was first working with one of these back in the day. So let's take a look at what I'm using to solve that guiding problem here. So this is an off-axis guider. Um, this is designed to solve those problems of tracking um, when you're dealing with something like a large SCT. So essentially what you're looking at is a guide scope combined with your main camera that all hooks in to the back of the telescope. So how does this work? So with an off-axis guider, you start by having it connected straight into the back of your scope like you would a focal reducer or spacer rings or whatever. You have it hooked in there and then when the light is coming through here, there's actually a small prism that is grabbing some of that light as it comes in. So if your light is coming through this way, the prism grabs it and shoots it straight up. So that's where you have your guide camera placed. Now, if you notice the prism isn't directly in the center, right? It's up off to the side here. So the idea is I only need this part for the imaging sensor on the camera. So this is light that's actually being unused at this point in time. So kind of do some spacing to adjust that so that it isn't dipping in and creating a shadow on your camera. And then it comes up to, to your guide camera here. So what is the big benefit of this? Well, the benefit is that once you have this all together, it's one piece. So first of all, flexure is you know, mostly gone, right? There, there aren't different pieces here that are gonna bend at different rates. They're all, all one part, but it's also one light path. So as I mentioned before, that, that mirror kind of moving and flopping around, if anything changes in that mirror path, 
the stars that are seen in this one and the stars that are seen in this one are coming off of that same, same mirror. So anything that happens there should be noticed here. This can correct out as your mirror may be changing or, or moving slightly throughout the night. So your guiding stays good there. The other part is when I was talking about the difference in pixel scale, that, that resolution that you're getting when you're using a small guide scope on top of a bigger main scope. Well, that also goes away here too, because once again, you're using the same light, the same, same bounce off the mirror. So the stars in this one and the stars in this one are at the same magnification. Right? Sensors may be different in terms of pixels and whatnot, but roughly you're at the same magnification level. So as long as this guy can find a star in here, it should move at about the same amount um, based on the zoom in factor as what it's moving in the main camera. So much, much easier for this to stay locked on. Now, this is something that tends to scare a lot of people. I know it scared me early on. And with some good reason. It takes a little bit of setup and a little bit of learning to figure out how to make all this work. Um, mainly because in order to make this thing and this thing work well, they have to both focus at the same time, right? So what you're looking at is you're focusing your scope, you know, just in one spot here. And it's got to bring both this camera and this camera into pretty close to the same focus at the same time. So when you have your light coming in, essentially if you need, you know, let's say it's 130 millimeters from the back of the scope to get to good focus, then you want this sensor at 136 millimeters and you want this at 136 millimeters. And in the middle there is that right angle of the prism. So that can sound like a lot of math, um, but it really isn't too bad. Most of the, the, the scopes that you get come with a, um, with a sheet on what their back focus requirement is. And then a lot of the various off-axis guiders have instruction sheets for hitting the common back focus amounts. Um, in this case, this is the Celestron Deluxe Off-Axis Guider. Um, I got this one because it was really designed with these Edge HD scopes in mind. Um, so its instructions were really good on, you know, here's how much this piece takes up, that piece takes up, and what you need coming off of the back of it. Um, so in this case, the guider is really just this part and this part here. And then I knew based off of what it said there, you know, the Edge HD needed uh, whatever it was, 136 millimeters coming off of it. Here's how much this took up, which leaves this much math to come up with. The camera has six and a half millimeters of back focus. I can look that up just by looking the camera up and searching for back focus in its specification sheet that's normally on all the various retailer sites you would buy it from. And then I need to know how wide the filter wheel is. Once again, specification sheet just by looking it back up um, on either the, the main vendor website or, or wherever you bought it from. Um, and then, so take those numbers out, take these numbers out, that leaves X amount of space needed for the main camera. That's where you then go get your spacers. So, you know, this thing came with several spacers that the off-axis guider did. So I was able to make it work pretty much with what, what came with it there. So then I can put this in, make sure this focuses. That's kind of the first step. Once the primary camera is focused, fantastic. Let's now try to get this guy focused. So when you're focusing this one, once you've already focused the main camera, you don't touch the focus on your scope, right? Because now you know I have one camera focus. So now it's all about it, where's the spacing on this camera? Is it too high, too low, whatever? So uh, first of all, the, the Celestron off-axis guider comes with a little helical focuser here, which is nice. It'll let you build up, it'll let you, you know, kind of fine tune it a little bit, but it doesn't have a whole lot of travel. So it's not really going to be like your primary focuser where you're going the long way around. Um, so what, you, what I did here is I just took the camera out by itself, you know, didn't have it locked down here. I had it plugged in, I just kind of moved it up and down just by hand, uh, you know, just to see uh, where it would get close on the focus. And in my case, it actually was, even with the little nose piece adapter that comes with this QHY guide cam, it was actually a little bit above where the primary focuser stopped, or where the, the tube stopped here. So I needed a little extension tube for this one. I happen to have one lying around. Um, I think there were also a couple little things that came with 
um, the Celestron, but the Celestron assumed that you had a guide camera that could screw in to the top. I have one of these kind of eyepiece sized ones. So I just needed to, to get something that had a thumb screw on it. Um, but I put that in and then once I did that, I could get it pretty close to, to good focus, just sliding up and down, lock it down. Then I could use the helical focuser to dial it in a little bit better. Um, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect because at the end of the day, especially if you're using a filter wheel, each filter you put on is going to change the focus slightly and you'll kind of redial in focus. So this will probably be a little bit out of focus depending on your filter. And that's okay. You know, PHD2 is able to deal with slightly out of focus stars. But, you know, even off, if you're off a little bit more than that, the stars just disappear entirely. Right? You're looking at it only what goes into that very small prism. So you're not going to get the same kind of big field of stars. You might see five or ten stars in this one. Um, so you really want to get the focus close. And then once you have that, uh, you're in pretty good shape. But I will tell you, do that focusing kind of work during the day. Like point your scope out at a roof, you know, halfway down the block or more so that you can get it you can you know what you're looking at right you're not searching a black screen for a couple of stars right you know you get that that roof line in there i really like roofs because the shingles have some nice hard lines on them as well as little speckles so it's very easy to tell on the main camera when you've got it in focus and then when you go to the guide camera yeah you know you know what you should be seeing based off of what you're seeing in that main camera you should be seeing something very similar uh, in the guide camera. So it's it's very easy to kind of get those dialed in. And then once they're dialed in, you don't touch it, right? You now have your spacing right. You're not going to have to focus this thing every night. It's in, it's in good shape here. So then all you got to do is put the whole assembly on the back of your scope. Now with a lot, most of these off-axis guiders, they have a removable couple of pieces. So like in this case, this is a little, little screw on tube, screws onto the back of the scope. And then literally this just slips on, you tighten these screws down. And now you're on. So very easy to remove the whole thing off of the back of the imaging train. Similarly, there's the same kind of three screws on the back that I can remove from the back here. Um, I wouldn't say you're typically removing them as much, so much as it is if you loosen one, you can adjust your rotation. Now you're probably not gonna adjust the back part of the rotation with this on here because you want this kind of not in the way of your main sensor, but same kind of thing here. You loosen up one screw and then you can turn the whole assembly. And that can be really nice to get your framing just right um, and things like that. Um, but once you have it, you have it and it's in pretty good shape from there. So that's what I've set up to try to jump into the deep end of the pool here and get some higher focal length astrophotography going. Um, it took a little bit to kind of recalibrate PHD2, rerun the guiding assistant to make sure that uh, it was working at its best settings for, uh, for this particular focal length. And then once I had it together, I did a few, few test shots um, on a particular target at the very beginning, just as a first light target to make sure things were working. And then I did a longer actual imaging run that first night on a galaxy um, so that I could see if I had things actually working for doing real deeper sky imaging. So let's go ahead and take a look at how all this turned out once I had it all out under the stars. All right, so here we are on the computer now to take a look at what uh, things look like once I got everything up and running. So it was a little bit of a challenge to get uh, all the guiding kind of reset up and everything, get the focus right. But once I had it, you know, everything went, you know, relatively smoothly. Uh, so I was, I was very happy with the, the results overall. I still have not done things like get, uh, you know, a, a, a motorized focuser or anything like that. So I was just using uh, a batten off mask um, and some of the the focusing tools and things like sharp cab uh, to get my focus in right but um, but really to, to start off with I wanted to show you you know one of the images I took with my old scope I say old scope but with my my wide field scope uh, of the horsehead nebula I just pulled the the luminance out of it since uh, what I'll be showing you is just kind of a black and white one for comparison here but this is this is the horsehead nebula kind of area here and you know like I said you know this 
a refractor, especially something white field, is great for these kinds of shots, right? Uh, you know, you can can get some very nice fields of view. But if I wanted to look at the horse head itself, and this is after processing, this is a fully processed image for me. You know, this is what I'm getting to if I really wanted to look at the horse head itself, right? Um, so, you know, that zoomed in field of view is is tough. And so my first light image was going and seeing, you know, kind of what, what things would look like on, on kind of the tighter in view for the horse head. And this is what I ended up with here. So trying to put these a little bit on apples to apples. If I zoom in till they're about the same here, you know, just look at that level of detail difference, right? First of all, my stars are much, much smaller because I'm not having to zoom in on things that were were bloated out. Um, but, you know, just all of this detail in here that I was able to get uh, now with that zoomed in, that, that higher focal length, right? And this is, I have not processed this one out. This is just kind of the stack of about 15 uh, five minute images. So five minutes in guiding and coming down looking at my stars, I can tell I got a little bit of a divot at the top. The five minutes might have been pushing it. I might have started to get some trailing in there. But, um, but overall, a very successful test for the first light here. So after doing the first light test, I also wanted to try a real target, you know, for, um, for the night. And so what I went with here was I went over to a galaxy. So I went looking for uh, a galaxy that would fit well in the field of view, that was kind of in that realm of what I was looking to get the scope for, something that was relatively small, but, uh, but had a lot of detail in it and that I could see, you know, hopefully from the backyard here. So I went with the Sunflower Galaxy. So here's just the luminance uh, that I took of that. I took... L, R, G, and B um, on it in one evening here for a total of about five hours, about four and a half hours um, across all the filters. And boy, I'm just super happy with how well the, the luminance turned out overall, right? Um, especially given that, you know, my backyard is, is fairly light polluted. Um, you know, I really got a lot out of this. And this is just barely cropped in, just doing the edges here. So you can really see how this, this big field of, or this more zoomed in field of view can really really bring out some of these targets. I, I spent a lot of time imaging the Sunflower Galaxy last year without a lot of great result. You know, um, it, it just seemed too small um, and I really wasn't getting everything that I was looking to get out of it. And so, you know, after combining this and working with it, um, on RGB and really trying not to, to overstretch it more than anything else uh, for a first night kind of look. This was my final on the RGB for the Sunflower Galaxy. Um, and I'm, I'm just really happy with how all this turned out. You know, I, I certainly could get better, um, you know, with, you know, either longer time on it or maybe tweaking settings and things like that. But for a first night out on it, you know, I really kind of couldn't be happier with the results of this here. Uh, overall, uh, you know, the stars are pretty round. I got a lot of great detail in here uh, for the time I was putting in. So this was um, two minute exposures um, on the luminance and then three minute exposures on the color. Um, I think I could probably play around with that to get less time on the color, but maybe boost the gain um, or something like that. So I could still get good color data without spending as much time on it. But um, but just overall, you know, coming in here on the detail, you know, really got some good detail out of this. Uh, this did get a lot of help from deconvolution. Um, I think uh, overall I was... Uh, my stars were a little bit more bloated. I could probably get a little bit tighter on, on some of the things like my focus, uh, especially since this was all kind of manual focused early on in the night and then I just let it run. Um, so I'm sure my focus shifted a bit throughout the evening, uh, that kind of thing. But, uh, but definitely a, an image that I'm happy to have uh, in the group of stuff that I've done. So a really good first night uh, out with this new scope. Um, and it really gives me a lot a lot of encouragement that um, that I've learned a lot. you know uh, yeah, I the first images that I took 
through a C8. Now, granted, it wasn't an Edge HD one, but the, the primary difference with the Edge is that your stars should be better out to the corners than what they were uh, under a normal C8. But my, my original first image uh, from a C8 was, was pretty rough. Um, let me see. I'm sure I still have it here. These were, were kind of my first images through a C8. And granted, this is a different camera and all the rest of it, but you know, you know, these are these are still stacked images. I think there are only probably 10 or so in each of these, but this is a world the Whirlpool Galaxy when I first started astro imaging. You know, I wasn't doing flat or dark subtraction, so I've got hot pixels all over the place. Um, you know, I really didn't know how to work with these, let alone uh, acquire them well in the first place. And so to go from that there to now this uh, is just such a validation of, of all the time and effort spent in on this, um, you know, for what is still the same basic scope at the end of the day, just with some improvements to make it even better long term. Um, so that's it. That's that's my experience so far with the Edge HD 800. Um, you know, seems to be a, a really nice scope for the uh, for the size and for the 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 weight and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, hopefully it should should really get me some good starts on that deeper end of the pool that I want to get into with astro imaging. Um, so I hope that was interesting for you guys. Uh, you know, and until next time, I wish everybody clear skies. Thanks.